Well, good morning again. Welcome to Central Church. We're a Jesus Church, uh, where everyone is welcome, where no one is perfect, but where everyone is loved, and where anything is possible. Summertime, and uh, summertime is always a fun time. Folks go away to cottages. I hope you're enjoying that. Um, we, we're doing our summer challenge where we are collecting this year um, for the Cambridge Self-Help Food Bank. Uh, we're correct, uh, ah, can't even say that, collecting cereal. And I said, please don't do the sugar stuff, do the good stuff. And the goal for the whole summer was 500 well, if you look up there, you see we are at 484, and it's only the fourth Sunday. So we're close to the 500. So I was thinking, um, why don't I challenge you? Why don't we do 500 times two? One is nearly done. I am sure we can do another 500 boxes. Are you up for the challenge? I am sure you are. I know you by now. Thank you for what you've already done. Thank you for what you are going to do. Thank you that over the summer you don't forget about taking care of the church and also for uh, looking after everything. We really appreciate that. Thank you for taking care of all of the needs of the church as well. Please continue to pray for the preparations for our summer students, for the preparations for VBS, all the things that need to happen around that. As these things happen, we'll kind of show you that again. Uh, we'll make some videos and put them on so that you can see them uh, as well. Remember, we are online, but we are in church. This is not a live stream. It's recorded ahead of time. Uh, Sundays, we're in church. Uh, we're allowed up to about 150 Feel free to come and join us. If you haven't been to Central Church, you'd like to come and see what we do in the summer, feel free to do that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, you are amazing, and you are gracious, and you are loving, and you care for us. So much that your son came into this world when everything was a mess, and you turned our hearts and our lives around, and we thank you for that. And this morning, again, Lord, as we talk about really big things in our own lives as well, thank you that you will bless us. Thank you that you will open our hearts to receive the words that you give and open our minds, but also our lives so that they become a reflection of who you are. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you Cause when we see you We find strength to face the day In your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away
Starting a little two-part series today called, What Would You Do? So, today I'd like to talk with you about an issue uh, that I think many of us uh, can relate to. But it's also an issue that many of us uh, assume uh, that other people struggle way more with than we do. I want to talk with you about this thing called judge mentalism or being judgmental. And I know immediately when I say that, the hair on the back of our neck just kind of goes up. Here's the thing. A little bit of research over the past 15 months, which have been, I don't have to tell you, difficult, shows that there has been a huge, huge spike in judgmentalism, contempt, blaming, condemnation, finger-pointing. And, and when I say that, I think many of you are smiling and saying, oh yeah, seen that, seen that. Not just in the world, but unfortunately we also see that in the church. So let's talk about being judgmental, or actually I want to say not being judgmental. But, but it comes with a little bit of a warning. Usually when we talk about big subjects like this, uh, something happens which I like to call mental finger pointing. So I'll sit in the pews and I'll say, oh, I wish John was here today because this message was just meant for him. I hope my sister-in-law uh, is watching on YouTube or Facebook because she really needs to hear this message. Nothing new happened in Jesus' time. So we're going to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is preaching these wonderful things about how the kingdom of God works and the things that are in the kingdom of God. And he speaks about things like adultery and divorce and loving each other and caring for each other. And, and as he talks about this, all of a sudden, he just takes a moment to talk about, uh, don't do mental finger pointing and don't judge because he knows as he talks about these big subjects, that's what's going on. So let me take you to our scripture reading for the day from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 to 5. Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? 
How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not judge, says Jesus. Now, there are many of Jesus' words that we need to say. Let's try and interpret this. This one is clear-cut. There's nothing to interpret. Jesus says, do not judge. And he doesn't say, but, but there are a few expectations. Uh, you can judge when, when it's a humongous sin that you see. Or it's okay to judge as long as you don't make a habit out of that. No, no, no. Jesus unequivocally says, do not judge. Here's the thing. When we look at Jesus' life, he didn't just say this, but Jesus lived this, right? If you look at his whole life, Jesus didn't judge the broken and the hurting and the needy and those who were messed up and the sinners. What did he do? He loved them and he opened his arms for them. The only time we see him kind of point fingers, judge, was when he spoke to the religious leaders of the day. And why did he talk to them like that? Because he spoke to them about that spirit of judgment and condemnation that was in their lives. But Jesus also says, do not judge, because when we judge, there's a little bit of a problem. The second part of the verse says it so clearly. Do not judge or you might be judged. No, no, no. Or you will be judged. So there's the problem. The moment we start doing this, it'll come right back this way. So Jesus then, to explain this, starts using images from the world in which he comes from, uh, from carpentry. And he talks about be careful how you measure, because the measure that you use to measure other people's lives is the same measure that will be used for you. In other words, he's saying that the same criteria that I use to judge other people's lives will be exactly the same criteria that will be used to judge my life. So, so you think that person is really arrogant, self-centered. Okay, said Jesus. But let's measure your heart first before we go there. So you look down on that person who made a really bad decision in their life and messed up. Okay, says Jesus. But let's start measuring your Decisions first. Because the same measure with which you measure, you will be measured. So do not judge. And now I know. And now I know you're sitting there and you're saying, hold on a second, Aubrey. Are you saying we should just tolerate sin? It's okay. It's all fine. Should we just say, when Scripture teaches us this and people live not according to that, we should just say, listen, it's 2021. And this is what we do in this culture. You do you. Is that what Jesus is saying? When Jesus says, do not judge? That we just tolerate? Well, let me, let me take you, let me take you to, to the answer by looking at Jesus' life. And we find this answer in, in how Jesus treated people. And I'm going to take you to one of the most well-known stories, John chapter 8, the woman that was caught on adultery. So they bring this woman to Jesus. And they let her stand right there before Jesus. And, and the law of Moses has already said 
she's guilty. What does Jesus do? Does Jesus look at her and Jesus says, Hey, I just tolerate you. No worries. Does Jesus look at her and say, Hey, you do you. No, he doesn't. He says to this woman, Leave this place now. Go. And then leave your life of sin behind. Can you see that? That's not very tolerating. That's not very affirming. But that's love. But here's the thing. There's a huge difference between love and affirmation. God looked at the world and loved the world, but God did not affirm the sin that was going on. His son had to die. But let me give you a, a way more practical example of that. My wife loves me with all of my flaws, all three of them. But that doesn't mean that she affirms everything in my life. She doesn't look at me and say, I hope you grow in your impatience and in your controlling. And I'm so happy that these flaws are going to be part of our children's lives. She loves me, but she doesn't affirm everything. When Jesus looks at us, he loves us. He died for us. He believes in us. But he does not affirm all of those things that are wrong in my life because he knows of the devastation that comes because of sin. He knows how that sin in my life separates me from God. So let me take you back to the story and see how Jesus does that. When they stand here with this woman before Jesus and they have the rocks, She's already condemned because, yes, she was guilty. She did this. But as they stand there, ready to throw the rocks, Jesus reminds in a moment of the measurement. And he says, it's good. She's guilty. But let the one of you who has no sin now take the first rock, and throw. But measure carefully. Because the measure with which you measure, you will be measured. And do not judge, or you too will be judged. And in that moment, they all drop those rocks and they walk away. Not because of the fact that the woman, what she did was right, wasn't right. Not because of the fact that it wasn't sin, it was sin. But in the moment they stood and they measured, they realized they were just as guilty as she was. And so are we. And that's why judgmentalism is so offensive to God. Because who am I to judge? Because if I really measured, how? Do I measure up? So Jesus continues using these images from the carpentry world. And then he uses this image and he says, so if you have a plank in your own eye, don't you who have planks go look for the speck in your brother's eye. Take that plank from your own eye and remove it first because before you start looking at the plank in your brother or your sister's eye. So, so, so let me, let me physically explain this to you. So here I am. I got my plank and I'm looking at you and say, Oh, I see a little speck in your eye. Hold on. Let me get a little closer. Don't worry. I'm not going to put this plank in your eye. I just want to remove that little speck. Don't worry about my plank. There's a tiny little speck. Let me see how silly that looks. No wonder Jesus says in verse 5, Oh, you hypocrites. 
Now, remember, I told you this word hypocrite. I've explained it to you before. In Greek, it's called hypocrites. Hypocrites was the name of an actor. Those who played, or that's what an actor was called, those who played in the Greek dramas. They were called hypocrites because hypocrites means those who speak behind a mask or from behind a mask. In other words, they play different roles. For different roles, they use different masks. So they pretended to be something that they were not. Oh, you pretenders, says Jesus. You see that little speck, but holy moly, what's going on there? Because you see, what we do, hypocrites, masks, I will always minimize my problems. But other people's problems, I will always escalate them. I will always exaggerate them. They're way, way bigger than mine. My problems, you don't understand. They're small, but yours, have you seen yours? My problems, listen, if you knew my background, if you knew my circumstances, you would not even look at me. No wonder, Jesus says, you hypocrites. Because here's the thing. When we do this, when we start pointing fingers, when we walk around and we have this huge plank and we are left, right, and center pointing out little specks, we're not just judging people, which we shouldn't, but we're actually pointing people away from Jesus, when we condemn people, when we are mean to people, when we point all those fingers at people, all they say is, is that how God looks like in you? And then they turn away from God. Look at Jesus' life. Jesus never used, used judgment to bring people to repentance. He died on their behalf. To bring salvation. But we think if I criticize enough, then, then my criticism will turn them around. If I judge them enough and I'm judgmental enough, their lives will change around. Well, how's this worked out for you so far? That's why maybe we should look for an answer. Book of Romans. Where God speaks, Paul speaks about what God says about this. And I want you to go read this. Romans 2 verses 1, to 4, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Go, go read those. I'm just going to use the one verse. It talks about judging. And he says, don't judge. Be careful about this judging because this is not meant for you. You shouldn't be doing this. And then he says in chapter 2 verse 4 of Romans, don't judge. Why would you want to judge? Or... Do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness? God's forbearance, which means God doesn't just act immediately, takes time. And God's patience. And not realizing that God's kindness, God's kindness, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. What leads people to repentance? God's kindness, God's patience, God's forbearance, not acting immediately or impulsively is the Greek word, which we can Put together in one word, it's called grace. Because grace says, I look at you and I realize these broken things in you. And I love you. And grace says to you, because you know that you are loved in your brokenness, you are able to change and become the person that God intended you to be. Condemnation cannot do that. 
no matter how right I am. Affirmation cannot do that, no matter how nice I am. I love the way in which uh, another pastor, Scott Dudley, uh, says this. Scott Dudley says, The problem with tolerance is that it says, No change is necessary. You're good. You're okay. You do you. The problem with judgmentalism is that it says, No change is possible. You are who you are. You're done. Good luck when you get and stand in front of God. But grace says, change is both necessary and possible. How? Through Jesus and the grace of Jesus. And living that grace towards people. So how do you choose to live your life? So join me next week for part two, when I'm going to talk very practically about how we live a life of grace, which says change is necessary, but change is also possible. Amen. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Thank you for not judging us. Thank you for taking all of the sins with your love and placing them on Jesus and through your grace allowing us to be changed from the inside out. Help us, Lord, to live every day lives filled with grace so that you can be seen and your love can be seen. Help us to live like Jesus. In your amazing name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted.
amazing love I know is true It's my joy to honor you Amazing love How can it be That you, my king, would die for me Amazing love, I know it's true It's my joy to honor you In all I do, I honor you As always, it was so much fun to spend the day with you. Reminder, next week, part two of what would you do? Uh, as you go and live in this week, go live with these beautiful words of promise. That the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, that grace that says, change is necessary, but also possible. And the love of God our Father, that love that is all-encompassing. And the amazing fellowship, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the paraclete in our life, will be with you. Amen.